welcome back to part three of the rapture controversy. Well, let's get back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and deal with another what is regarded as a major rapture proof text. Let's pick it up in verse 15. For this we shall say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We're going to look at this now in detail. Now a very obvious thing I want to draw your attention to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 15. It says, we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. We are alive and remain, not to the going away of the saints, but to the coming of the Lord. In verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Now plainly and simply, to remain is the opposite of to depart or to be raptured. Now in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 15 18, there are a number of different thoughts given to us that I want to look at. We, we read about being caught up. We read about being caught up in the air. The scriptures tell us about a shout, about a trumpet, about being taken in the clouds. Now, all of these words are not used randomly because they're poetic and uh, they seem to be uh, the most choice words. They're actually all terms and thoughts lifted off the page of the Old Testament. Now, you remember before at the very outset, I said that the Bible must be allowed to interpret itself. The Bible is its own best commentary. The scripture cannot be broken. And when we discover that the writer here is taking all of what he's saying in the New Testament from the Old Testament, it, it becomes, becomes sharply into focus what is being talked about here and what is going to transpire. Let's look at this now. Next, I'm going to look at this phrase, caught up. And because so much is made of this phrase, I just want to remind ourselves again of the basic rule, one of the basic rules for interpreting the Bible and establishing doctrine, that we need two or three witnesses. Genesis 41 verse 32, and for that the dream was doubled under Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God and will shortly come to pass. Job 33 verse 14, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Deuteronomy 17 verse 6, At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. death. <laughs> Second Corinthians 13 verse 1, This is the third time I am coming to you, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I just want to hammer it home now as I look at the Bible explanation of caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Here's a great principle concerning dealing with the truth, the word of God. Where we have the weight of scripture, that would be the large body of truth, and then we find a phrase, maybe something like caught up, a phrase or a scripture or a passage that appears not to be in harmony with everything else that we read in the scripture, then we should never throw out or reinterpret the weight of scripture, the large body of truth in favor of that scripture or passage or phrase that appears not to be in harmony with the rest of it. No, we should never do that. Instead, what you and I should be doing is that we should be seeking God for understanding concerning the part of Scripture 
the passage, the phrase that does not appear to be in harmony with the rest of the scriptures. For in doing this, the Lord God, through the operation of the Holy Spirit, will remove the scales from our eyes. We will receive revelation as to what, as to what that scripture or passage that we're having difficulty with actually means. Let's keep that in mind. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. This phrase or word caught up is in the Greek hapadzo and in its various applications in the scripture means to catch away, to catch up, to pluck, to pull, to take by force. And so uh, this is believed by those that hold to the futuristic point of view that this caught up, this hapazo, is in fact the rapturing away, the secret rapturing away of the church. And uh, volumes have been written on this Greek word hapazo. And if you go and check the internet now, if you haven't already, you'll find there's huge amount written concerning the hapazo or the rapture of the church. But does it, does the word mean to take from heaven, sorry, does the word mean to take from earth into heaven? Is that what the word means? I know that that's what it's taught it means, but what does, what do the scriptures give us concerning the use of the word hapazo? This should be most instructive. John 10 verse 29, no man is able to hapazo them, pluck them out of my father's hand. Jude 23, and others save with fear, hapazo, or pulling them out of the fire. John 6 verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and hapazo, or hapazo him, take him by force to make him king. Acts 23 verse 10, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force, to go down and hapazo him, take him by force. None of these references here, although they are to snatch, to catch, to take by force, but none of them involve taking someone from earth and catching them away into heaven. None of them do. It's, it's a descriptive word to snatch, to catch, to seize. But let's go on further and look at other an expansion of the meaning of this word. Drongo. Here we read about uh, Patso in John 10 verse 12, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not See if the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catches away the sheep, doesn't it? Catches them and scattereth the sheep. What does the wolf do with the ones that it catches? It eats them, it consumes them, devours them. That is the thought of this Greek word hapazo or hapazo. Matthew 13 verse 19, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away, hapazo again, that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receive the seed by the wayside. The wicked one comes and he devours, he consumes the seed, lest it take root and grow up. Acts 8 verse 39, and when they were come out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away, harpazoed Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And of course, it's plainly obvious that when Philip was caught away by the Lord, he was taken from one place on earth to another place on earth. He wasn't caught away into heaven away up there. Let's move on. So an underlying thought as to the meaning of the word hapazo is that the lesser is caught up, is included into the greater. That's what happened 
when the wolf harpazoed the sheep. It ate it. It caught it. It devoured it. When uh, the wicked one and consumed the seed, it caught it away. It harpazoed the seed. It ate it. When when Philip was caught up, caught up by the Spirit, he was caught into the Spirit and taken from one place to another. Nobody was removed from the face of the earth and taken away into heaven, but rather the lesser was caught up into the greater. Let's just read one more thought along these lines. Just a final thought of, of being caught away, of being uh, padsoed with the Lord when he comes. John 17 verse 21, Jesus prays that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also may, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Do I want to be caught away by the Lord? Absolutely. Do I want to be included into the Lord? Absolutely. For this is the very thing that our Saviour prayed, that we might be caught up with him. And this is the thought and the idea, it is not the snatching away from this earth into heaven, but to be caught up with the Lord when he returns fully, finally, and completely. Bless the Lord. I hope that this has been of help to you. The next thing I want to deal with in First Thessalonians chapter 4 is the location of the meeting in the air it tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 that we will meet the Lord in the air. I want to look at this word air. There are three possibilities as to the meaning of this word in the Greek because it's used, uh, the word air, as comes through to us in the English, comes from three different Greek words. The first possibility for the word air is the Greek Air, A E R, meaning the immediate surrounds. The second possibility that our English word air could be in our Bible is from the Greek word uranos, meaning high up where the birds fly, the domain of the fowl of the air. The third possibility is eporino or epor eporanios, which refers to heaven. Now, when we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, do you know which Greek word is used to describe the meeting the Lord in the air? Is it high up where the birds fly? Is it heaven? Or is it the immediate surrounds? Wouldn't that be interesting if we knew what the answer to that question is? Well, it's very easy to find out. Well, the Greek word used for air in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 is the Greek word air, A-E-R, which refers to the immediate surrounds, not to heaven, not to the region where the fowl fly. It refers to the immediate surrounds. The same Greek word is used in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. Paul was not referring to uh, beating the air way up there. He's figuratively speaking about like shadow boxing, hitting something that's not really there. That's the same Greek word used in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. Again, we have the same word used in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 19. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air, into the immediate surrounds. That's what it's referring to. The meeting in the air 
given to us in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 is much, much closer to earth than we have been taught. Now, we're going to go much further into this now. So if you think this is not really in harmony with what the scripture says, let's keep reading the scriptures. The very concepts and thoughts that are given to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as I said earlier on, are taken from the Old Testament. The foundation of the New Testament is the Old Testament. If we're going to understand the New Testament properly, we need to go back to the foundation and have some familiar, familiarity and working knowledge of the Old Testament. So let's look at Moses who went up to God because we are wanting to go up to God, aren't we? Exodus 19 verse 1, in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they, they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai and had pitched in the wilderness. And there Israel camped before the Lord. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain saying, Thus shalt you say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel. Now, Moses went up to God. Where did Moses go? Moses went up to God. Moses went up the mountain on earth and God was there. Moses, to go up to God, to meet God, Moses did not have to leave the planet, did he? Let's keep going on. Moses went up to God. Look what happens. Exodus 19 verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us about a being caught up in the clouds, doesn't it? Lo, I come to thee in a thick cloud that the people may hear, and when I speak with thee and believe and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. Where and how did the Lord come to Moses? The Lord came down to Moses who was on the mountain. The Lord came down to Moses who was on the mountain in a thick cloud. What we're given in the New Testament is built upon a foundation. The foundation is the teaching given to us in the Old Testament. We need to let the Bible interpret itself. Again, Exodus 19, verse 9, which we've just read. We'll go to verse 11. And be ready against the third day, for the, Lord, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Where and how did the Lord come to Moses and the people? The Lord came down to Moses, who was on the mountain. The Lord came down to Moses, who was on the mountain in a thick cloud. The Lord came down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. Did the people meet the Lord? Yes, they did. Did Moses go up to God? Yes, he did. Where did everything happen? Where was all the action? Was it away in heaven or was it on earth? No, heaven came down, didn't it? The Lord came down and the earth was the sphere of all the action. And that's the way it's going to remain, brothers and sisters. The Bible must be allowed to interpret itself. Exodus 19, verse 11. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend. It means the Lord himself shall come down from heaven. With a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The Lord is coming down from heaven. We are not being taken away into heaven. The Lord himself is coming down. He's done it before. He's going to do it again. Praise ye the Lord. The Bible must be allowed to interpret itself. God appears and the people of God do not disappear. 
Exodus 19 verse 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day. For the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. For, let's go to the New Testament. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, the Lord is coming, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And let every man that hath this hope in him purify himself even as he is pure. In Exodus 19 verse 10, the people had to sanctify themselves because the Lord was coming down. In 1 John chapter 3, we are told to be purified. Every man that has this hope of seeing the Lord must, be, uh, must purify himself. Uh, we're talking that, about in, in Exodus 19 verse 11 that the Lord will come down. In 1 John chapter 3 verse 2, we're talking about the expectation of when he shall appear. Are the Old Testament and the New Testament working together in harmony? Absolutely. We're told in Exodus 19 verse 10 that the people have to wash their clothes. Again in 1 John chapter 3 verse 3, it talks about being purified, washing, sanctification. Why are we doing this now? Because the Lord is coming down in the sight of all the people. He is coming, we are not going. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we're given the words, shout, voice and trumpet, all words taken from the Old Testament. Exodus 19 verse 16, it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, it's going to happen again in a much more grand scale. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Is the Lord again going to appear from heaven? Absolutely. Is he going to come down from heaven to earth? Absolutely. Are we going anywhere no, we are not because he's coming, we're not going. And everything that is given to us from first Thessal in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 has a Old Testament counterpart. Therefore, we can be sure that the interpretation that we are applying here to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the scriptural one and therefore the true and correct one. Exodus 19 verse 17 tells us that Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the nether part of the mountain. Where did the people meet God? They met God at the nether part of the mount. This is what is being brought before us brothers and sisters. Where are we going to meet the Lord? It's going to be here on earth. Praise the Lord. In John 14, verse 3, Jesus says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Is Jesus coming again? Yes, he's coming again. He's coming down. I will come again and receive you unto myself. We talked about being caught up, being hapatsoed, the lesser included into the greater, and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. If Jesus is coming again, and he is, and we are not going away, and we aren't, then, we're Je then where Jesus is on this earth, so will we be also. Praise ye the Lord. John, uh, Exodus 19 verse 18, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in a fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. This is what's being presented to us in First Thessalonians chapter 4. 
the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. In Exodus 19, verse 19, we have the voice of the trumpet. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, we've got the shout with the voice of an archangel with and with the trump of God. In, in Exodus 19, verse 20, the Lord came down. In 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. In Exodus 19, verse 20, the Lord called Moses to the top of the mount. In, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, there's going to be a shout. There's going to be a calling together of the Lord's elect. Bless the Lord. In Exodus chapter 20, Moses went up to the top of the mount. What are we going to do? We're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds. We're going to go on in the next slide and talk about the clouds. We read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, that we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds. So we read the clouds and we say, hang on. It's obvious. It must be those big, white, fluffy things, cumulus nimbus floating away up there. See, the scriptures definitely tell us we're going to fly up away up there into the clouds. But the Bible must be allowed to interpret itself. Not what you believe, not what I believe, not what the books teach us. The Bible is its own best interpreter. Now, just before we look at the scriptural usage of concerning clouds, I just want to point this matter out, which is very striking, that the word the clouds used in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 is actually the Greek word nephili, which James Strong in his concordance uh, gives this meaning, a cloud used of the cloud which led the Israelites in the wilderness. Now, I hope that that arrests your attention straight away because this is quite striking. We generally thinking, we read 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 and we say, we say straight away, oh, we're going to meet the Lord in the clouds. Have we ever considered what this cloud is that is being referred to here? Have we ever pulled out the concordance and checked it out. If you're like me, the answer would be no. You just assume oh, it's obviously the clouds. But there is more to it than that, far more to it. Now we're going to go on and see what the scriptures say and see whether or not that backs up what Strong's concordance is saying or not. Let's check it out. In Exodus 19 verse 10, and it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Where was the cloud? They looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Did they look away up into the sky? They looked toward the wilderness and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The cloud was on earth in the wilderness. In Exodus 24, we'll pick it up in verse 17, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. Where was the cloud? Moses went up into the mount and a cloud covered the mount. The cloud was in the wilderness, on the mount, it was on earth, and it was in the eyes of all the children of Israel. Moses went up to God, he was in the glory cloud of the Lord, but he never left the earth because the glory cloud had come down to where he was. Do you think that's going to happen again? I think it's going to happen again. Leviticus 16 verse 2. Two, and the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron, thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud where upon the mercy seat. Where was the cloud? For I will appear in the cloud 
upon the mercy seat. The cloud was upon the mercy seat, which was on earth. The Lord came down in a cloud on the earth in Israel's camp. He appeared upon an earthly, in an earthly tabernacle upon a mercy seat and met the people here on earth because heaven comes down to earth. We don't go. The Lord comes to us. This is what it is to when we speak about meeting the Lord in the clouds. This is in the clouds explained to us from the word of God. Here we read Nehemiah's commentary on Israel's uh, wanderings in the wilderness in Nehemiah 9 verse 19. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsook them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Was that pillar of the cloud away up there in the sky? No, it was not. It was on earth. Was the pillar of fire away up in the sky like Aurora Borealis? No, it was not. It was on the earth. Isaiah 19 verse 11, the burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt and the idols of Egypt, Egypt shall be moved at his presence and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it the Lord is coming and he's coming in clouds he rides upon a swift cloud but it's not talking about those big white fluffy things up there isn't it the glory cloud of the Lord the cloud of the Lord is something that accompanies him when he appears on earth so how high do you have to go to be in the clouds of the Lord, the glory cloud of the Lord, to meet the Lord in the cloud. How high do you have to go? Deuteronomy 31 verse 15, And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of a cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. How high above the earth is the glory cloud of the Lord? Apparently, it's not very high. So if you can beat the air and touch your immediate surrounds, you're very close to the glory cloud of the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. In 1 Kings 8 verse 10, we've got the dedication of Solomon's temple, and it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Where was Solomon's temple? Where did God come to? Where did the glory cloud appear? Is the New Testament based on the Old Testament? Or do we just take First Thessalonians chapter 4 and we say, hey, we know what all those words mean. And we come up with something that was never intended by the Holy Spirit. We must understand this is why we need to be Old Testament Christians, not just New Testament Christians, not just Old Testament Christians, but full gospel, Old Testament Christians. Does God change? God cannot change. He cannot repent. Therefore, we must change and we must repent, not only of our sin, but of all our foolish and wrong ideas. Can the scriptures be broken? No, but you and I can and must be broken. Everybody that comes must stumble. Going to meet the Lord in the clouds? Praise the Lord. Where do the Lord's people go when they go into the cloud of God? Numbers 11 verse 24 in the Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and sat them round about the tabernacle and the Lord came down in a cloud. Do we have two or three witnesses here, brothers and sisters, folks who are listening? Yes, we have a abundant of scriptural references to understand where you go to meet the Lord in the cloud. The Lord came down in the cloud and spake unto him and took the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders and so on. 
God always comes down to man. That is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. Again in Numbers 14 verse 14, And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them and that thou goest before them by day time in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. God always comes down to man. Is it possible, brothers and sisters, that there is a glory cloud here even now? Hebrews 12 verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Well, if you're a born of water and of the Spirit, if you've been baptized by the Holy Ghost, then God has already come down personally into your life. I'm not suggesting for a minute that we have seen the fullness of, of this. No, we are waiting for the appearing of Jesus Christ. He's coming down in clouds. We know what that means. But is there a glory he, even here now? Are we not yet lifted up into heavenly places? Or do we just not believe it because we don't see with our eyes? Lord, I believe Help thou my unbelief. The sin that does so evil easily beset us. Well, I think that's talking about unbelief. That's what stops us from progressing. That's what stops us from learning. That's what stops us from seeing with the eye of faith. That's why we live so far below the what God has called us unto. That's why our lives don't look like what is recorded in the book of Acts. Because we don't believe in the power of Pentecost. We say, oh, it's just for those days. Oh, we say only some. It only, uh, the gifts are only given to some. We don't understand that the gifts are given to all. And, and there are some appointed to instruct us in that way. We don't believe uh, that healing is available to all. Even though we read in the scriptures that everyone who got prayed for in the scriptures, in the gospels and in the book of Acts, everyone always got healed. We don't believe because of our the glasses that we have on, the dark glasses, our traditional mindset, which is shaped by our own experiences and church upbringing. It's time to complete the Reformation and go back to the scriptures in every aspect. So, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. This we say unto you, that the word of God, by the word of God, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall remain, and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. According to the Bible, the meaning of the words clouds, shout, trumpet, and caught up all relate to an event that will happen here on earth as God's people enter into his glory at his appearing. We need to sanctify ourselves. We need to purif purify ourselves to get ready for the glory here and not over there or way up in heaven in the sweet by and by somewhere on those big white fluffy things. This is the message of the scriptures, brothers and sisters. One plus one equals two and it doesn't equal something else. Let's think about Jesus now. Hebrews 12 verse two. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Seeing as Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith, we are commanded to look unto Jesus. Now let's look unto Jesus in the context 
of all the things that we have been speaking about in this rapture controversy presentation. The Lord Jesus Christ, he endured 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. It was on earth. 40 days of temptation on earth. Was it real? Yes, it was very real. He was transfigured and glorified on the earth. We read about that in the Gospels, the transfiguration on the mount. On the mount. Did Jesus leave this earth to be transfigured? Hardly. He was glorified on this earth. Jesus, the scripture record us, he was under the glory cloud of the Lord, and that was again on the earth. The cloud had come down, and out of the cloud the Lord spoke. All of this happened on earth. As a man, the voice of God spoke to Jesus while he was on earth. You're getting the picture? Where is everything happening? Where is all the action? It's on earth. Let's look unto Jesus, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ endured the open shame and suffering of the cross on earth. Did Jesus endure great tribulation? Yes, he did. Where did he endure great tribulation? He endured it on earth. Imagine if Jesus had the same kind of policy that a lot of those in the pulpit are teaching today, that you're going to escape great tribulation. What would Jesus have prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane? Lord, take this cup from me. He wouldn't have added in, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He wouldn't have added in that. He'd be screaming, take me out of here, Lord, I don't want to go through it. No, no this, uh, the example that Jesus Christ gives to us is one of enduring and going through great tribulation on earth. He was made perfect through suffering and so will you and I, and so are you and I. Look at this. The opening of the graves that accompanied Christ's crucifixion and resurrection recorded in Matthew 27 verse 52. The opening of the graves was upon this earth and we read in the scriptures that many of the saints came from their graves and they went into the cities round about and spake with the people. Did the, did the people... The saints of old that were resurrected at that particular time, did they fly off to heaven? No, they were resurrected and they stayed upon this earth. Now their resurrection at that time prefigures our resurrection at the coming of Jesus Christ. This was just but a small taste. This was but a forerunner what we read here in Matthew 27, verse 52, of the great resurrection that is to come. And brothers and sisters, when the greys release their dead, it will not be to fly away into the sky. It will be to be resurrected on earth and to stay on earth. This is ever the teaching of the scriptures. Jesus Christ himself, when he was resurrected, what happened? He stayed on earth. For a period of 40 days, obviously it was necessary in the plan and the purpose of God that he go back, that the Holy Spirit might then be given upon us, the Spirit of Christ, that Jesus would then come to us in spirit and indwell us, and that we would do greater works in his name. But let's... Just consider, just for a moment, when Jesus Christ died and he rose again, he was resurrected on this earth. He wasn't resurrected at that point to fly away into the sky. And he, Jesus, received his resurrection body on earth. And we read about that in the Gospels after his resurrection, how that he could appear in one place and then disappear and suddenly appear in another place altogether. How he could apparently just appear inside a, 
a building that was all closed closed off. He had a resurrection body, which is our hope and expectation that this vile body will be put off and that we will be clothed with, with a body like under his glorious body. And that, dear friends, will happen on this earth and not away up in the sky in the sweet by and by. Let's remember Matthew 10 verse 24. The disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord. But when we perfected we shall be like our master. Bless the Lord. What did Jesus die for? Did Jesus die for our sins? Yes, he did. Did Jesus die for our sicknesses? Yes, he did. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. But did Jesus die for our problems? No. Did Jesus die for our persecution? No, he did not. Did Jesus die for our tribulation? No, he did not. Will Jesus help us through our problems, our persecution and tribulation? Absolutely. Will, be, will he be there in the fire with us like he was with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? Absolutely. He will be there. He'll take us through the waters, through the rivers, through the flood, through the fire. But don't confuse that with the work that Jesus Christ came and did. He did not come to take away persecution, tribulation. No, he did not. But on the positive side, in terms of our sins, absolutely. And in terms of our sicknesses, absolutely. If we are living in sin, Jesus has called us out of that. Are we living with sicknesses and we're perhaps saved already, born of water and the Spirit? Well, go on and realize what Jesus has died for and pray and ask in faith and believe nothing wavering because, because as, in as much as he died for our sins, he died for our sicknesses and don't put any barriers in our way but don't go to the lord with our problems and persecution and tribulation say lord take it all away from me for because this is your will it's not his will let's get things in the right order and understand what jesus died for at calvary amen well there are many unsupported and unscriptural thoughts that get preached to us from the pulp pulpits that we even sing in our songs like one fine morning when this life is over i'll fly away we stop singing that song because it's unscriptural how about the saint that says words to the effect i can't wait to get out of here that is against the will of god that is against the expressed will and purpose of god the idea the saints will not go through tribulation or the tribulation totally contrary to the scriptures we're going away to heaven how many times do you hear that we're going away to heaven and not recognizing that heaven is coming down to earth uh, there's a song that some of us sang in my background singing about was a very beautiful and lovely sounding song about my home beyond the sky hang on a minute our home is here. It's not away over there. It's unscriptural. I have a mansion just over the hilltop. Nope, sorry, unscriptural. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. But the roll is going to be called up here, not over yonder. Unscriptural. There's a lot of unsupported and unscriptural thoughts. We find that uh, in more recent times that uh, there's quite a lot of songs that we just uh, kind of park or uh, they're nice sounding songs but they're just unscriptural 
and they can they lead you thinking in the wrong direction let's get back to the Bible let's get back to the truth here's a couple of big movie bloopers here's the left behind movie series starring Kirk Cameron whoops that one's a bit embarrassing and then there's a recent one left behind starring Nicolas Cage whoops what uh, what did they base those movies on not on the Word of God they based it upon books written by men probably Christian men in many cases Christian men who were in error who do not understand the Word of God in this area in particular and then you've got this whole left behind novel series that's uh, you can even go to Wikipedia and get a little commentary on that the left behind is a series of 16 best-selling novels by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins dealing with Christian dispensationalist end times the pre-tribulation pre-millennium Christian eschatological well there's a big word viewpoint of the end of the world um, fiction of course they're written from a fiction point of view but their underlying premise of the rapture is fiction it's not true here's another famous uh, book the late great planet earth by Hal Lindsay mm, not scriptural brothers and sisters I don't know if uh, if you're uh, familiar with that book but uh, was it was a bestseller of the day I don't know how it rates now but uh, totally unscriptural not based on Bible doctrine have you ever th thought about pulling a rapture day prank well it can be quite funny I did it with our children we had a little we had a little joke uh, one day and then I I said I screamed from the hallway and then the the kids came in the hallway and they saw my clothes laid out my shoes my pants my shirt laid out as if I had been running and when they realized what was happening we had quite quite a laugh unfortunately though millions and millions of people believe the rapture and that is not funny millions for millions of people the rapture is their hope and comfort and that is not funny at all that's very serious because it's so wrong now we know that Jesus Christ is coming back as a thief in the night in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 we read about being caught up into the air we read about uh, the Lord himself descending from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel with the trump of God and the dead in Christ being risen first and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air we what was brought brought before us when we understood it in the language of the Old Testament what the Lord has done in the past he's going to do again but this time on a far greater and mightier scale it's going to be a tremendously noisy event it's going to be a noticeable event every eye shall see him this is not going to be a secret but still he comes as a thief in the night for that first Thessalonians 5 verse 2 says for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night Revelation 16 verse 5 behold I come as a thief now this doesn't mean when the Lord says he comes as a thief in the night this is talking about his timing no man knows the day nor the hour when he comes back in that sense this part of it is very much a secret he's coming as a thief but brothers and sisters when he gets here he's not going to act like a thief because he's coming in power and great glory with the uh, as we just said before with a sh with a shout with a voice of an archangel and the trump of God everybody's going to know every eye will see so when we talk about in the scriptures that Jesus comes as a thief in the night this is referring to the timing of the event it's not talking about how he will behave when he comes and secretly snatch away Christians hardly the thought in those days of a thief coming in the night was that the thief would or the band of robbers would sneak up on the outskirts 
of a small town or a village. And they would come in quietly at night and then they let it rip. They went forward, they raised their swords, they blasted their trumpets and they went in and pillaged that city. That was a thief in the night. That was a thief in the night in Bible days. This is how the Lord is coming. A thief in the night. But when he gets here, if you're uh, not on the right side, you'll be, you'll be scared. It will be a dreadful day. Bless the Lord. We know these things. And that if we watch and keep our garments, we won't walk naked and our shame will not be seen. Praise the Lord. That's the end of part three, and I'm excited about it all so far. I hope you are. Let's go to part four next.